doing it. I'm doing Does a little justice. Yeah, I wonder how to look. You look at net net. Oh, you where do you want to look? Then okay. I want to show them if this side is out even. Then this yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. And just all of our people, our phones are all on stun. Yes. <laughs> the woman who grew up not seeming to care about what she looked like is it? <laughs> it's, it's a burden, believe me. <laughs> What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader or will you follow? Are you a fighter or will you cower? It's our time to take back the power. What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader? every day started with me doing hair and makeup there were 600 days give or take in the campaign and it was an hour to an hour and a half so being really conservative say an hour to do hair and makeup I calculated it and I spent 25 days doing hair and makeup <laughs> and I knew that the men I was running against didn't <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to do any of that. Uh, get up, take a shower, shake their head, they were ready to go. <laughs> this is what I have to put up with. This <laughs> is the real friend. Like... <laughs> All right. Are you going to come up? Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> good. 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 What do you think? I think it looks good. What? We can start button. And then, you know, when you get wound up, you can unbutton. <laughs> Honestly, Bernie just drove me crazy. He was in Congress for years. Years. He had one senator support him. Nobody likes him. Nobody wants to work with him. He got nothing done. He was a career politician. He, had, he did not work till he was like 41, and then he got elected to something. It was all just baloney, and I feel so bad that, you know, people got sucked into it. Our topic is Wall Street. For those just joining us, I've laid out a very aggressive uh, plan to rein in Wall Street. Not good enough. <laughs> Why, over her political career, has Wall Street been a major, the major, a campaign contributor to Hillary Clinton? Uh, now, maybe they're dumb and they don't know what they're going to get, but I don't think so. Well, John, John, wait a minute, Pers wait a minute. Personal he privilege. Has basically, he has basically Clinton used his respond. answer to impugn my integrity. Let's be no, frank not. here. Oh, wait a minute, Senator. Bernie was getting increasingly negative towards Hillary. What he did was go out there every day and basically say Hillary Clinton is corrupt uh, over and over and over again. The latest poll among likely caucus goers in Iowa showing Sanders closing in on Hillary Clinton in the Hawkeye state, and that has her campaign admitting they are nervous. Thank you. Iowa has never been particularly receptive to me. You know, in 2008, uh, it was not at all. And by 2016, it was tough. It was tough in part because it was so close and we were fighting for every vote and every delegate. I was a huge Bernie Sanders supporter, but now I think you have me convinced to caucus for you. Thank you. Thank you. That means the world to me. So. Thank you. Our brand new poll shows Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders locked in a virtual tie in Iowa. Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, they are clearly uh, in, a, in a close race right now. First of all, what we see on the Republican. Fuck! Very horrible. We all lost. Lost. That's what you get. Oh, she's up again. Three, three, only three. Once inevitable Hillary Clinton, neck and neck right now with Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Is that race still too close to reject? We have team coverage. Hey, this is a nail biter. <laughs> <laughs> So we gotta think what we're gonna do. We gotta think about how we're gonna play it, what we're gonna say. 
when we're going to do whatever it is we're going to do. When we started telling people on background. What? We started telling people on background that he got the turnout that he wanted and we're still winning. Yeah, well, so, but we have to decide if we're going to go out and say that even though everything's not in. Yeah. And, you know, what the consequences of that are if we go out, we say it, and then, you know, we end up behind. Right. I just don't want him to get out. Yeah. And claim the revolution is working, people felt the burn, we're on the way, we're going to win this. You know, that's that's what, he, if He's I were to do that, that's yeah. what this I would say. That. This is going to be like a half a point either way, so it's just it's not, not enough to change out there. fundamentally. Can't so, change, so. Okay, let's figure it out. I think we can say oh, this yeah. is great for the parser. I mean, it's great, you know, yeah. the, the turnout. If people okay, want to start talking about, well, it's good for the party. That is not a winner's I mean, that is not like. So, I'm just going to drop for one second because it's gotten closer. Mm -hmm. She's basically, her, but it's what's top of mind, what has her pacing up and down the hall is. She doesn't want him going. She first. doesn't want him out first. Now, they said he was going to call, which obviously, I don't know, we're holding right. the phone. I mean, they said he was going to call. That hasn't happened. She's just right. going to freak out. I just think it's, it's so close. I think we just, if he's. We believe he Speaking, is gonna. Right? We believe he's gonna go out before 11 p.m. and say he declare victory, whether he wins or not. Right. Right. He's just done so well that he's. So she should go speak right now. She, she should go. Let's go. All right. Yep. Let's go. Do it. <laughs> Breathing a big sigh of relief. Thank you, Iowa. After beating Bernie Sanders in Iowa by a razor-thin margin, Hillary Clinton has come to the Granite State as the underdog, trailing Sanders by 18 points. The mood was really bleak in those days in New Hampshire right after Iowa. Many critics and even some Democrats who are on the fence about voting for you say they don't trust you. They do not believe that you are honest. They have issues with your trustworthiness. We don't trust her. I think it really drove the Clinton campaign crazy that she was the first woman to win the Iowa caucus, and it was like it didn't even happen. I mean, everybody just talked about how well Bernie did. Okay. Secretary, what do you say to your New Hampshire supporters who are disappointed that you didn't have a bigger win over a 74-year-old socialist for Vermont? <laughs> and then here she is in Bernie's backyard in New Hampshire, knowing that she's going to lose by a lot. I, you know, when you know you're going to lose, it's really hard to campaign. This is my favorite part of uh, any kind of campaign. Oh, it's with you. No, it's in your book. It's a lot happening. I know, okay. It's pretty over. I feel that way a lot. <laughs> You know, I I just gutted it out. Got about 20 seconds here, guys. She very much wanted to go on offense against Bernie. If you're out there on the campaign trail every day and your opponent is saying you're corrupt, you're in the pocket of corporate interests, she wanted to stand up and defend herself. There is this attack that he is putting forth 
which really comes down to, you know, anybody who ever took donations or speaking fees from any interest group uh, has to be bought. And I just absolutely reject that, Senator. And enough is enough. It's time to end the very artful smear that you and your campaign have been carrying out in recent weeks. And let's talk, let's talk about the issues. Let's talk about let's talk the about issues that divide us. Okay, let's talk about so issues. Let's, let's talk, talk about issues. Let's Senator Sanders, Secretary Clinton, obviously we've touched a nerve. That is good. I think she's, she's getting her point across. Good for her and calling him out on the insinuation. Next question here. Secretary Clinton, it's addressed to you, and it's about this issue of the speeches, uh, particularly to, to Goldman Sachs. She asked whether you would release the transcripts of your Goldman Sachs speeches. Don't you think the voting public has a right to know what was said? But let's make that bigger. Are you willing to release the transcripts of all your paid speeches? Would you release all of them? I will look into it. I don't know the status, but I will certainly look into it. Let's have a whole fucking two-hour debate. It's all just going to be fucking, where's your transcript? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Oh, man. But what does she mean she'll look into it? She controls them. Why won't she release them? She doesn't know what transcript she has. She has no idea. Why would she know? Because any contracts require you to take them. But they didn't require you to keep them. Wait. <laughs> we did. Wow. We deleted the little email. That's what I said earlier today, Brian. <laughs> why, during the uh, debates, when you were asked to release the transcripts of the Wall Street speeches, why did you not want to do it? You know, I wanted to force him to release his tax returns, so I made it a, you know, I made it a trade. You release your speeches, we'll release our speeches. You release your tax returns, we'll release our speeches. And maybe I dug my heels in, thinking, you know. This is ridiculous. Like, what are we doing with just having to release all our shit enough? This is like, in all seriousness, I think there are some legitimate reporters that would say, fine, but for $200,000 for a couple hours, it's not crazy to say, what exactly did you say? I made speeches to the Camping Association. I made speeches to doctors. I made, that's how I made some money when I got out of being in uh, the State Department. I didn't go on somebody's board. I didn't sign up to lobby for somebody. I didn't take one of these phony jobs where you're fronting for a corporation. I didn't do any of that. I gave a speech for an hour, and they paid me. You know, if you live your life worrying about optics too much, it can consume you, and you become the, this, you, you know, get yourself tied up in knots. But she's giving speeches to Wall Street at a time when they had gotten federal money to bail them out to put yourself in a position to be seen as being too close to them uh, was a mistake. It's a fundamental thing with the Clintons. And she thinks, I can't be corrupted or compromised because of a speech. There is this sense that she knows that she is an ethical, moral, righteous person. And therefore, you know, if she decided this is an OK thing to do, then it's OK. And anybody who criticizes it must be doing so for illegitimate reasons, because you know, they're partisan, they're enemies. And um, she's a very, she's supremely confident in her own uh, righteousness. And that can blind anyone. That could, that could uh, trip anybody up. I just voted for her. Thank you. I'm great. A divided household. Nice to see you. Come to the bright side. In November. All right. Let's take your hand, sir. You're just on as a president. Yeah. Big. You're a liar and your wife's a liar. She'll do great. Thank you. When we lost by 22 points, it really settled in. This was going to be a slog. The primary season was not going to be a short path to the nomination. It was going to be a grind, primary by primary, caucus by caucus. And we were already tired. She's calling him now. We, uh, someone worked out with them that, someone worked out with them that we are going to speak first. I was like, is this what 2008 felt like? Emma, and she said, yeah, this is what it felt like. We're going to lose. She and John and I are like, we're going to lose. We are going to lose the Democratic primary. Bernie Sanders is going to be the Democratic nominee. You guys could not have been 
more supportive. You guys did everything Thanks, you could. We got hit by a gale force wind. <laughs> Did you feel that this election was different than any that you had participated in before? Or did oh, you yeah. feel, is it on a different <clears throat> level even than your 92 election? Well, my 92 election, no, the 92 election was about, it was a populist election, but it wasn't insane. It was more about, you know, positive populism. Bill had served five terms as governor and was thinking about the presidency. Anybody who knew him knew that he would do it eventually, and it was just a question of what was the best timing. And when everybody thought after the first Gulf War that George H.W. Bush was absolutely unbeatable, I thought he could be beaten. The economy was shaky, debt was rising. There were pieces of the American dream that were battered. I got a call from a guy I knew in Bush's White House. And he said, you don't want to run now. Just wait till 96 and you'll win. And he basically said to Bill, um, you know, we've looked at the field and we think we can beat everybody, but we think you'd be the hardest to beat. And I am authorized to tell you that it's uh, our advice to you that you not run, that you wait and you run in four years but if you do run, we will destroy you. He said, this is the way Washington works. The press has to have someone at every election, and we're gonna give them you. We're gonna fill their heads full of so much stuff, you won't believe it, and you will not survive it. We're gonna take you out, and we're gonna do it early. So I told Hillary about it. I said, you realize what this means, don't you? They will keep their word and they will make our lives miserable, and they will do things we can't even imagine. Well, she said, if you can be bullied out of the race, you have no business being president. And I basically said, well, you know, they clearly think you can beat them, so you gotta run now. For 12 years, the Republicans have tried to divide us. They want us to be angry at each other so we won't be mad at them. They want us to look at each other across a racial divide, fixated on one another so we cannot turn our heads and look to the White House and say, why are all our incomes going down? What is happening to all of our jobs? Why are we all losing our future? I believe that together we can make America great again. And that is why today I proudly announce my candidacy for President of the United States of America. It seemed to me that he was the most liberal electable candidate. And I was very impressed with Hillary. It was clear that she would play much more than a ceremonial spousal role. We believe in this country, and we cannot stand by for one more year and watch what is happening to it. She was in need of a press secretary. Traditionally, um, in politics in those days, you know, you were always aspiring to be the press secretary to the candidate. And I thought, this is really different. Yes! She wasn't only a surrogate she was involved in the strategy of the campaign. Those who know her best say she has an uncommonly good sense of political strategy. When to push, when to wait, who to trust, who to pressure. Oh, she's critical to the campaign. We often joke that our campaign slogan should be buy one, get one free. It was true that she had been a full partner in what I did as governor, that the voters were fully aware of it and fully able to vote for or against it if they didn't want to. So the Clintons are running as a team, and reporters frequently hear people in the crowd say they think the wrong Clinton is running. Why aren't you running? There is a draft Hillary movement. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember rallies, and just all of these young women, they went out, and it was like, oh, it's Hillary. 
She has been an activist for children's issues. And as a successful lawyer, she makes three times as much as her husband. Her coming on to the public stage really brought to the forefront feminism and women's roles in society. I am who I am. I mean, that's, I'm not about to change who I am or what I have been for all my life. We need an end to the politics of abortion, and we ought to give women the kind of support they need to support themselves, their families, and be full functioning citizens. She was that Rorschach test for that discussion in every household about what is the role of women in our society and should they have careers or should they not have careers and should they stay home and raise families. She very much became a symbol, a cultural symbol. We didn't hide that light under a bushel. We shone a light on her because I just thought she was the most impressive person I'd ever met in my life. And we're like, this is great. And from the first day of the campaign, she was absolutely central to the strategy, but then also to the to the execution and the survival when we were in trouble. Yes, I was Bill Clinton's lover for 12 years. And for the past two years, I have lied to the press about our relationship to protect him. The truth is, I loved him. Allegations of infidelity have dogged Bill Clinton for some time. Have you ever had an extramarital affair, Governor? <laughs> well, if I had, I wouldn't tell you. It was all over the tabloids. Bill Clinton, who I guess was the front runner of the Democrats, is in a little trouble here. Stories about their relationship, his extracurricular activities, it was crazy. Everybody had heard the rumors about Bill Clinton. And everybody wondered how Hillary Clinton dealt with it. Did you ever discuss it with Hillary, or was that too much? Nope. Mm -hmm. And she never brought it up? No, she doesn't. She is not a confider, let me just tell you. I, I think that, you know, we were by no means perfect, and we had challenges like any married couple would have. I, I'm not going to go any, any further than that. In our Clinton world, there was always a, a question, not had he been faithful to his wife. He'd already told us he hadn't been. But were these stories true? And frankly, to this day, I don't know what's true and what isn't true. Do you have any comments about the allegations from Jennifer Flowers? There were hundreds of reporters, camera crews, and boom microphones, and cameramen backpedaling and falling into each other. And she had this look of a trapped animal. She was being hunted for some kind of response. I am a private person. But I think it's important to be a private person if you're in the public arena because the crushing intensity of total wall-to-wall -wall coverage, the expectation that you share your innermost feelings with people. Is there anything left if you've basically lived everything out in public? We wanted him to answer it, not to disparage anybody else, but to simply say, here's why we're gonna persevere. CBS said, we'll create a special edition of 60 Minutes, butted up against the Super Bowl. The biggest audience possible. It was ridiculous to me. It was a decision that uh, the campaign made, that it, it would make sense. I thought it was a big uh, invasion of our privacy. I didn't understand why we would do it. Bill decided to do it. So I said, OK, I'll do it. I, I think most Americans would agree that it's very admirable that you had s have stayed together, that you worked your problems out, that you seem to have reached some sort of an understanding and, and an arrangement. Um, wait a minute, wait a minute. But <laughs> wait a minute. You're, you're looking at two people who love each other. This is not an arrangement or an understanding. This is a marriage. That's a very different thing. You know, I'm not sitting here as some little woman standing by my man like Tammy Wynette. I'm sitting here because I love him, and I respect him, and I honor what he's been through and what we've been through together. And you know, if that's not enough for people, then heck, don't vote for him. If she's not there, sitting next to him, validating him, that's the end. Uh, and instead, she's telling the public, look, whatever problems we had in our marriage, I've dealt with them, therefore you don't need to worry about them. And that was enough. But it set a marker for where she would be for years to come.
the person who was constantly required to forgive and prop up a husband, no matter how many things he had done to hurt her. And later in American life, we would rethink that kind of role for a spouse. But at the time, it was seen as, you know, an act of, 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 of courage on her part and a way to, to say, okay, well, we can move on. The question of Mr. Clinton's recent problems leads you to believe that he has an electability problem? Yeah, I think he's got a big electability problem. Well, what do you think it is? I want to tell you what it is. He's been right in the front of the Washington Post today. He, he is funneling money to his wife's law firm for state business. That's number one. I don't care what you say about me, but you ought to be ashamed of yourself for jumping on my wife. You're not worth being on the same platform I'll tell as my you wife. something, Mr. Clinton. Now, don't try minute. to escape it. Jerry Brown I accused Hillary of making money off her governor husband. For years, Hillary Clinton, named one of the top lawyers in the country, says she went to great lengths to avoid any conflict of interest. She was the only woman partner there and the lowest paid partner, in part because she had insisted that she not participate in any profits that came from doing business with the state of Arkansas. Governor, what, Governor, Governor, what about Jerry Brown's attack on your ethics? Well, he attacked my wife last night for having a law practice. That was amazing. And he, mis he deliberately misrepresented the Washington Post article. Isn't it a conflict of interest for her to represent clients with the state? I don't. Ask her. Ask her. My firm does a lot of business ever since I've been in that firm. I have not shared in one dollar of state funds that has ever, ever gone to my firm. Does Governor's wife make you an important rainmaker for your firm? I wish that were true, <laughs> but it's... Doesn't that create no, the appearance no. of conflict? You know, I suppose I could have stayed home and baked cookies and had teas, but I, what I decided to do was to fulfill my profession, which I entered before my husband was in public life. I'm watching that off to the side of Stephanopoulos. He elbows me in the ribs, and I elbow him in the ribs. He's like, Ugh! And I've tried very, very hard to be as careful as possible, and that's all I can tell you. Thank you. And I wander over, and the cameras have left. I floor side, saying, you know, Hillary, they're going to kill you for this. She said, what are you talking about? I said, you just said that stay-at-home moms were no good and that you wouldn't want to be. She said, no, no, no. I was talking about the, like all the frivolous stuff that first ladies sometimes are required to do. And I said, that's not how people are going to hear it. She said, Paul, my mother was a stay-at-home mom and she's my hero. I said, that's not what they're going to hear. And I still, I can see her. It was her last moment of true naivete with the media. She put her arm around me. She said, Paulie, you just worry too much. Nobody's going to think that. <laughs> I was ready to like her. Not now, you know, after what she said. I mean, she obviously doesn't have respect for what I do. The backlash, it took on a life of its own. She has a flippin' attitude about all the women who stay home. She has no use for us, we have no use for her. You probably wish you hadn't said it in well, the first I wish place. What I had said before and what I would said after had all been part of the soundbite, but I, I'm learning that that's not uh, always what you could expect. Even when I thought I was trying to reach out and, and be as forthcoming as I could or to you know, kind of reveal myself. I, I just felt like I was running into brick walls all the time. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out what is it they want from me. Every time she tried to break the script and be extemporaneous, you know, the, she winds up being criticized, so she stops. You know, it's like a flower that just keeps on closing down until after a while you appear packaged. We're at the Palmer House Hotel in Chicago, and we would filmed it for focus groups to see what was working and what wasn't. And when she walked down the stage, the dials in the focus group just went Brrr. Bill looks at it, takes it in, and says, you know, they just hated her hairstyle that night. Obviously, it wasn't what it was. It was that she'd just made this comment about moms, and he knew that. But he, he was not going to brook any discussion of maybe or her having hurt him, being as she had just saved him. After Tea and Cookies, she took a step back and really thought through how she was going to present herself. We have a little special something for whoever wins this bingo game. B-13. B-13. Critics said you've been muzzled. You've had to tone yourself down and, and not be so oh, visible. 
Well, I, I, if that's the case, nobody's told me. The Clinton campaign worked very hard on changing Hillary's image as the ambitious yuppie from hell. Her role, comments, and even her look have been moderated lately. There she was this week, holding her husband's umbrella. She has a new, softer hairdo, a new best friend, Tipper Gore. When the wives are introduced these days, it's to take a bow and step back. Those were, you know, decisions that, uh, that I made as a way to, you know, eliminate some of the friction. But the damage had been done. She'd been tagged an elitist and an ultra-feminist. Hillary has compared marriage and the family as institutions to slavery and life on an Indian reservation. This, my friends, this is radical feminism. I'm a little surprised that they resorted to the attacks on my wife. You know, it's almost as if they were running for first lady instead of president. And it's not really about Hillary. Uh, what they're trying to do is to make a thing against all independent working women, you know, trying to run against them in a way that I think is really lamentable. Not just a contest between Democrats and Republicans, this election has become a referendum on the role of women. Now, this has been called the year of the woman in American politics. The year this of has been called the, the year of the woman. woman. Well, 1992 was the year of the woman after the Anita Hill debacle. George H.W. Bush nominated Clarence Thomas, and Anita Hill came forward to say that she'd been sexually harassed by him. And then the hearings came. And, I mean, most of us were dumbstruck. Are you a scorned woman? Do you have a martyr complex? Are you interested in writing a book? Women were watching the dais full of only men you know, grilling this woman. You are not drawing a conclusion that Judge Thomas sexually harassed you. Yes, I am drawing that conclusion. That well, is then my... I don't understand. The treatment of Anita Hill sparked such an outrage. It became an example of a government administration that did not hear us, did not see us, did not respect us. And I think the tide began to turn. There are 11 women running for U.S. Senate and 107 the most ever chasing seats in the House. Contributions to groups that help elect women have tripled since the Senate's treatment of Anita Hill. Just one week before the anniversary of the hearings when Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, don't we seek our revenge? When I went to the Senate in 1986, I was the first Democratic woman elected in her own right in all of American history. Even in 1992, there were only two women, Senator Kassebaum of Kansas and myself. We were viewed as novelties. I mean, there was no ladies' room. Is there a gender revolution waiting to happen? Can American politics change so suddenly and so dramatically? I was thrilled that so many women were running, and I campaigned for a bunch of them. I think we know where the energy in the Democratic Party in America is today. I'd be glad to be on Dianne Feinstein and Barbara Boxer's coattails any day. Any political practitioner would tell you, maybe you can get one woman elected, but the idea that you get two, not possible. She is the new senator elected. Carol Mosley Braun of Illinois, Patty Murray, Washington State, Barb Boxer, Diane Feinstein, California. I felt like I was walking on the moon. There are so many new women in the Senate that Majority Leader George Mitchell ordered their own bathroom bill next to the men's room. The United States of America has a new president tonight from a new generation. I want to begin this night by thanking my wife, who I believe will be one of the greatest First ladies in the history of this republic. Hillary Clinton, who's going to be part of this new wave of powerful women in Washington, women who had ideas that could define this administration. It's Ladies' Day. I hear those drummers coming, Ladies' Day. It's been a long time coming, Ladies' Day. Ladies day.
remember just being almost in a state of delirious shock. I'm thrilled and excited. I'm starting to think, oh my gosh, what does this really mean? Because when you're in a campaign, you can't think about anything else. You just get up every day and you get out there and do your best to make your case. The Clinton campaign has a tough road ahead. Right now, Senator Bernie Sanders has more momentum. And she really is going to have to kick up her campaign to another gear. I've always thought of Hillary as sort of ahead of her time and never quite of her time. During the primary, she was being portrayed as the centrist, cozying up with Wall Street, and I think a wide swath of the Democratic electorate didn't realize that for most of her career, she was like the scary, bra-burning feminist liberal. It's like, oh, you spent most of your career trying to convince the world that you're not this scary liberal, and now you're trying to convince the world that you are a liberal. Um, yeah, it had to be exasperating. At that point in the primary, she's the loser, right? That's And that's it, and you have to live with that. But she is incredibly good as an underdog, and we marched on to Nevada. I think she was running the best when she was running scared. She was like going to the basement of casinos at midnight to shake hands with every maid, every cook. Good, how are you? Hey, Eric, how are you? Good, man, how are you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to wake up. Yeah, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, how are you? Well, thanks for letting me barge in at midnight. Good, how are you? are you? It's so great to see you. Hello, hello. I came to help. I know you're doing a hard job. And I also think, like, these were her people in Nevada. These were minimum wage workers. These were union workers. These were a lot of women, a lot of Latinas, a lot of immigrants. And she really connected with these women. When she got to the South, we knew this was going to be the firewall. It, it was her base. It was her coalition. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Almost every Sunday, we went to a black church with Hillary Clinton. And this wasn't something that she just like showed up ahead of an election. These are people who knew her, who welcomed her back to their churches. And she was incredibly comfortable in these settings. I don't want to be the president for only some Americans. I want to be the president for all Americans. The Clinton's relationship with black voters in the United States goes back decades. You know, Bill Clinton was dubbed the first black president many years before there actually was a first black president. And Hillary Clinton had relationships with a lot of the activists, movement leaders. She knew that if she could get to South Carolina in decent shape, that it could be a turning point in her progress towards the nomination. We're going to do the staff. Oh. Yeah, these guys are driving us around the whole state. Let's see what's happening now. You're winning. We're laughing at a good tweet. <laughs> 7525 sounds like a virtual tie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, South Carolina. Tomorrow, this campaign goes national. It was important that she had a really big showing in South Carolina because it was going to pivot her into the Super Tuesday states. And from New okay. Jackson. Oh, well, I'm glad Donald Trump. 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 Oh, well, I'm glad Donald Tr
five states are holding their primaries on March 15th. They are the five states that could decide. Ohio, Illinois, Missouri, North Carolina, and Florida. Hillary Clinton's people are already using the term nails in coffin. I think it all just came in. Yeah. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold on. Joyce, what do you know? Uh, isn't that great? Wait, shh. Wait, shh. Wait. He's awake. Oh, he's awake. He's probably trying to call you, Rob. Right? Yeah, I'm going to say. Because he's going to do it, because otherwise he's going to be like... Just a minute, hang on a Hello? second. <laughs> NBC just called it. Missouri? Yeah. <laughs> NBC and CNN just called Missouri. That's a sweep. That's a sweep. Yeah. That's a sweep. Yeah. 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 yeah, I know it is pretty hard to believe. <laughs> Why do you think people say, well, you know, she's so much different in person than she is in public? They don't feel like they know the real you or that maybe you're not as warm as they hear that you are yeah. behind the scenes. And I'm sure you've heard it oh, a million sure. times, the oh, likability sure. factor. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, yeah. But they bring that up with a lot of women. So I think there is, there's, there, there are certainly uh, reasons personal to me. Um, I also think, though, that my, um, my bluntness, my uh, outspokenness, my pushback, uh, all of that creates cognitive dissonance in people because I came to national public attention as, quote, a first lady. And there is a set of expectations about a first lady. And I violated them, you know, from the very beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, Bill Clinton, and the vice the First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton. The Clintons were the first iteration of the baby boom generation in presidential politics. For me, Bill Clinton was the first candidate I covered who wasn't dad. We baby boomers had a sense of righteousness. We had been the ones who marched against the war and in favor of civil rights. And we had a new set of morals that many people in the country found really threatening. The Clintons were going to knock down the establishment. Yes, we were trying to make change. We thought change was overdue. We thought change was necessary. I remember my mom talking to me about the first ladies that she really admired. She talked a lot about Eleanor Roosevelt. I thought a lot about Eleanor Roosevelt saying, do the thing you're most afraid of. You want to make a difference. You want to have an impact, well then, you gotta get in the arena. Right from the beginning, he gave her a lot of responsibility the day they walked into the door. They made it clear she wasn't there to bake cookies. She was the first First Lady to have an office in the uh, West Wing. The President's wife has two official offices, the usual one in the East Wing where parties are planned, and one in the West Wing where policy is made. I can't help but notice that this is an all-chick staff. Is that something that you did deliberately, or did it just kind of happen? No, well, no. Neil's over there, Neil's Neil. Over I'm there sorry. <laughs> Poor Neil. She hired all women, and I thought that was fantastic. You know, they were smart as a whip, and she empowered them all. We were encouraged to give our opinion. Like, I don't want a bunch of yes people around me, she would say all the time, you know? Oh, don't oh, yes okay. me on this. You know, what do you really think? There was something bigger that united us, and it was being reminded, often by the boss, why we are all here. We were part of a cause, you know, part of trying to, you know, do great things and have an impact on the country and the world. Hello, this is Hillary Clinton. 
I want to thank you for letting me speak with you about an issue that is central to our children's future, solving our nation's health care crisis. The president wanted her to work on health care. She gladly accepted the call. I am grateful that Hillary has agreed to chair this task force, and not only because it means she'll be sharing some of the heat I expect to generate. It was explosive that the president would ask his wife to do this work. I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to try to make a difference in people's lives. What's more important than health care? Keep in mind, Lyndon Johnson had the most democratic Congress in modern times. They passed Medicare. They passed Medicaid. He did not even try to get universal health coverage. Didn't even try. Harry Truman had tried to do it. Richard Nixon had tried to do it. And now Hillary Clinton was trying to do it. After hearing from people who had been denied medical coverage, the First Lady unloaded on the insurance industry. It's almost as though they decided that nobody should ever get sick. Uh, we should all just drop dead without ever having been in the hospital. She puts together a task force, smart people, policy wonks to figure out how to remake the system. Our goal was very simple. We were going to have guaranteed universal health care at an affordable cost for every American. Every American will receive a health security card guaranteeing a comprehensive package of benefits that can never be taken away under any circumstance. For her, it was always about policy. What is the best way to try to help these families? And I think she very much believed that good policy would be good politics. And that was not the story of that health care plan. I put her in charge of this committee for a simple reason that it had worked at home in what I thought was a more conservative atmosphere. But the truth is, when it came to the role of the First Lady, Washington was much more reactionary than Arkansas was. Mr. Michael and uh, Mr. Gingrich, are there any downside to having uh, the First Lady uh, head the health care task force? Be careful. Is there any problem with that at all? <laughs> well, now, now, you want to jump in on this? You want to... <laughs> <laughs> well, I could always ask my wife, I guess, to come be my representative. Hillary Clinton was seen as a more rigid, probably more liberal than her husband at the time during those first two years. And because she was out front on principle on issues that maybe half the country didn't think should go that far, it was easy to demonize her. Change the channel to a comedy show and see Hillary Stewart as the overbearing wife. Hillary, why don't you give it a rest? The argument was this left-wing woman is ordering her husband around, and, uh, you know, he's her poodle. Just constant attacks from, you know, shock and talk radio. And a whole bunch of guys' testicles are in Hillary's lockbox, her testicle lockbox. I can't remember any first lady who's been assaulted the way she was and treated the way she was. It never hurts at all. No, it really doesn't. Really? Nope. Not unless they go after a family member or my daughter. It looks like we're going to see who is the cute kid in the White House. No, 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 no. That's not the kid. That's, that's the kid. We tried to... Bill Clinton had to reposition the Democratic Party more to the center, and so there was less room for Republicans and conservatives to attack Bill Clinton as a crazy socialist or a leftist, because he wasn't. And so the Republican strategy became, we're going to get the Clintons through scandal. That was really the seed that led to the obsession with Whitewater, a scandal that started with Vincent Foster's death. At the White House today, the president may have had trouble concentrating on all this. Last night, his old friend and colleague, Vincent Foster, the deputy White House counsel, apparently took his own life. Vince Foster was a childhood friend of Bill's. Vince Foster and I, our backyards touched. And when Hillary went to work for the Rose Law Firm and Vince Foster worked there and became one of the closest friends she ever had, I mean, Vince's wife taught Chelsea to swim. He was a, a terrific law partner, a terrific friend, and was very excited about coming to uh, Washington. Police said Foster's body was found at this park just outside Washington, dead of a gunshot wound to the head. It was a very poignant 
example of how an outsider can come in wanting to do well and be just sort of not ready for the brutality of what goes on in Washington. As deputy to White House counsel Bernard Nussbaum, Foster had been involved in much of the early White House troubles. His office intensely criticized for its role in several events embarrassing to Mr. Clinton. There were appointments that fell apart. The blame fell to White House counsel's office for not having vetted them properly, and Vince Foster took it very hard. He was such a professional, and he was so dignified. I don't think anybody had any idea that he had fallen into a depression. The night before his suicide, I called him. I asked him if he wanted to come watch a movie. He said, no, he said, I, I've already gone home, and I really need to stay home with Lisa tonight. And I now know he already knew what he was going to do. I didn't think I could be more distraught or more shocked, but I was when I saw people starting to politicize it, starting to uh, spin ridiculous conspiracy theories. All of a sudden you get stories circulating in these outlets about Vince Foster having been murdered um, by the Clintons. Vince was managing their financial disclosure, tax returns, etc. So there were kind of two competing theories. One is that he knew too much and the Clintons had him killed. <laughs> the other was he knew too much and the only his only out was to kill himself. You know, think of the emotions of that. They were being accused of murder on the editorial pages. You know, who killed Vince Foster? It was nuts. We started being besieged by these vile accusations. And yeah, I think that made me even more restrained. The response by the Clintons and the people in the White House didn't help. They sealed off his office, papers were removed from the office. All of this looked weird, all of this looked suspicious. What's going on? He had been involved in this Whitewater deal and this is all the recipe for, for years of painful controversy. White water, it's an issue that will not die. There are hints, suggestions, and innuendo, but no smoking gun. I thought white water was ridiculous. No one knew what white water was about. It was a non-story and somehow was construed into a scandal. And she was seen as being kind of sketchy as a result. Federal Justice Department officials continue their investigation of friends of Bill and Hillary Clinton. Jim McDougal was a smart, small-town banker who traveled in the cozy circle where Arkansas politics and business blur. Jim McDougal was developing uh, property, and he came to Bill and he said, I think it's going to be a really good deal because a lot of retirees are going to move to North Arkansas. So would you guys like to be in it? It just came at a bad time. The, the... Interest rates went up, the economy went down, and so we lost the money. Jim McDougal went on to buy an SNL savings and loan. The Clintons didn't own stock in it. They had nothing really to do with it. Hillary's law firm did a tiny bit of legal work for it at one point, but they weren't the main law firm. In this building, the McDougals ran an SNL, Madison Guarantee, which the government has since shut down. Ultimately, Jim McDougal gets convicted of fraud sent to prison. The question was always, how much did Bill Clinton know what Jim McDougal was doing? How much did Hillary Clinton know what Jim McDougal was doing? Should they have known if they didn't? But to the Clintons, Whitewater becomes a metaphor for Washington, a metaphor for how people are out to get them, and that Whitewater was used as a vehicle to do just that. I mean, going all the way back to the Whitewater days, I don't understand, I've never understood this, and I probably will go to my grave not understanding it. All these things about us get disproved. But the press, and I'm talking about the major organs of the press, not the Breitbarts and the, you know, Infowars and the crazy people, they always bite. 
And I don't know why. I mean, it must be, there's an old joke about an old guy who's, you know, walking along the edge of a cliff and uh, he slips and as he's fallen down, he grabs onto a branch and he's holding on and he's praying and he's going, God, God, I've lived a good life. You know I have, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I was a good husband, I was a good father. I, I was an honest business person. I, Oh, please, Lord, help me, help me. And this voice, you know, just comes out and says, you know, there's just something about you that pisses me off. The Washington Post became quite seriously interested in what happened and a couple of people on story and began asking for documents from the White House. There was a famous moment when the Washington Post offered the Clintons to just sit down and make everything public, just answer all of our questions, and then that'll be the end of Whitewater. David Gergen wanted Bill and Hillary to do that. I was told by our lawyers that there are some embarrassing things in there, but there's nothing criminal. I told the president, it's gonna be a three-day story. Just get it out in the open, deal with it, and move on. He said, you know, you're right. Let's do it. I said, fine, great. So we started to walk out, and he said, but there's one thing we didn't talk about. I said, what's that? And he said, you know, Hillary was involved in this too. I said, yeah, I know that. And he said, well, we need her agreement, too. I said, fine, when, get back to me when you, when you have it. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. You have to go get her agreement. And I was sort of thinking, she's not my wife, Kimasavi. <laughs> you know what? So I got a call from Hillary's people saying, we've sent a letter over to the Washington Post. It's basically, dear Washington Post, screw you. We're not giving you any documents. I take responsibility for the unfortunate relationship that I have with the press. I was too quick to uh, be defensive. I just, I didn't, I didn't play the game well enough. I knew there was a game to be played, and I was striking out all the time. Christmas right. no. allegations. No, we're having a Does good time. Christmas for you? No, no. <laughs> the press started demanding a special counsel. We got to have a special counsel. We got to have a special counsel. And you advised him not to? Absolutely, I advised him not to. And anybody else who would listen, I said it was a terrible mistake. It, you shouldn't do it. I didn't think we had done anything wrong. Why would we agree to that? But you'll have to ask Bill. I mean, he. He basically was told if he didn't, it would be on the front page all the time, and he, all the other things he was doing that were so important would get drowned out. I got, and I, I told him to go ahead and do it. It's the worst mistake I ever made. It was a terrible mistake. Today, the White House finally gave in to demands for a special prosecutor. The Attorney General, Janet Reno, has named a Republican lawyer to be what everybody will surely call the Whitewater Special Counsel. All of us who were working in these senior roles were subpoenaed. Everything was asked about. And it got to the point where you couldn't get any work done. The first lady who so jealously guards her privacy suddenly decided to open up today. <laughs> How does my husband ever make these choices? These are hard choices. I'm wondering what kind of a toll, if any, this has taken on you and, the, and your and the president's uh, personal and political lives, and do you ever look in the mirror and wish that you just never got into this? No, never, never. I mean, some days are better than other days, but um, I try to do what I'm expected to do, which for me is working on health care. After Whitewater, people had these extreme reactions to her. So when health care is rolling out, there was a lot of question about whether she should remain, you know, in such a visible role. I remember we did a bus tour trying to promote, quote, Hillary Care. There were just so many protesters and hecklers.
There was a rally in Kentucky where they burned her in effigy. It was really scary because you never knew if, if somebody could, you know, just lose it. The uh, Secret Service came to me and said there could be violence, violence. They'd collected knives and firearms. It was the first time that I remember being physically threatened. Just so much hatred and the whole thing became toxic, absolutely toxic. And so what began as, I, I think, a noble cause went down in flames uh, against an opposition that was very, very tough. There's no question about the Republicans wanted to kill it. Cruel news for the estimated one out of seven Americans who are uninsured. Health care reform has been pronounced dead for this session of Congress. If you could have changed anything, any mistakes that you felt you made? Oh, I, I made, well, we made so many mistakes. I mean, we, you know, we were trying to do something that had never been done before, and I don't think I would have taken the upfront role. I think that was a mistake. I think that somebody else could have and should have led it. I could have been an advocate for it, I would have been a passion advocate. I could have traveled the country. But to take on the responsibility of chairing it and all that that entailed and all the red flags that that uh, put up, that was a mistake. I should not have done that. I was really crushed when health care went down. And then the election happened, the 94 election. This is truly a wildly historic night. I mean, this is just... <laughs> For the first time in 40 years, the Republicans have won control of both houses of Congress. It was a catastrophe. And they came in guns blazing. And a lot of those guns pointed at Hillary. And she is at a loss at this moment. She doesn't know what her role is going to be. It's not going to be health care. What's she going to do? So I thought, you know, I, gotta, I have to recede. I just created too much... Uh, static. So after all of that, how, how do you move on? Well, if somebody, if not just somebody, a number of somebodies, are attacking you, lying about you, making up stuff about you, um, you got two choices. You just can walk away and say, I don't care what they believe, and you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Or more uh, helpfully, you can say, it's not, I'm not going to let it bother me. I'm, and I'm, I'm going to fight back in every way that I can fight back. And sometimes you're successful and sometimes you're not. I mean, people still believe weird, wacky things about me because they've been told over and over again that, you know, I kill people, I rob people. I mean, who the heck knows what they're told? 